Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation of the Michigan Nature Association's Michigan Nature at Home virtual speaker series. My name is Lauren Ross, and I am the Communications and Events Coordinator for the Michigan Nature Association. I am very happy to be joined tonight by my colleagues, Rob Johnston, who is one of our regional stewardship organizers and who will be leading tonight's virtual tour of our Franklin F. and Brenda L. Holly Nature Sanctuary. We are also joined by Julie Stoneman, our Ed Director of Outreach and Education, who will be helping to monitor the chat box and any questions that come through. We will begin the presentation in a few moments after we go through a few housekeeping items. If you are new to the Zoom platform, you will find your Zoom menu options either at the top or bottom of your screen. Please feel free to enter any questions you may have in the Q&A box in your Zoom menu panel, and we will get to those in the order they come in at the end of the meeting. We have also enabled closed captioning for those who would like to use it. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob and he will start the presentation. Thanks for that introduction, Lauren. Hello everyone, my name is Rob Johnston. If we are joined by any Anishinaabe guests today, in particular our, our friends from the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, Ani, Rob Johnston, and Dijnikaz. Thank you all for taking time this evening to join us for this virtual tour of MNA's Franklin F. and Brenda L. Holly Nature Sanctuary. So to start, I'll give you a little background on Michigan Nature Association for those that are unfamiliar. Uh, MNA got its start back in 1952 when a group of conservation-minded bird watchers signed Articles of Incorporation to become Michigan Nature Association. Um, that means this year we are celebrating our 70th anniversary, uh, so please uh, keep an eye on um, our website and social media uh, for events dealing with that. Um, from 1952 to this year, we've grown to over 180 sanctuaries, both upper and lower peninsula. Uh, you can see on this little map on the right hand side of your screen. Um, each of those dots represents a sanctuary, and that's uh, all together, all, uh, all taken together, that's uh, thousands of acres of habitat protecting Michigan's rare, threatened, and endangered species. And if you see that little red star uh, in Mason County on the shores of Lake Michigan there, that is where we will be headed today. That's the Franklin F. and Brenda L. Holly Nature Sanctuary. So just a little overview of how this uh, We'll go today for our virtual visit. We'll start with a sanctuary overview. We'll get into some uh, history of the sanctuary uh, and then some stewardship, uh, kind of the two components of that, management and outreach. And then we'll take a virtual hike and we'll wrap it up with some Q and A. Um, that's always a highlight for, for everybody. So uh, if you think of questions as we're going through at any point, put them in the chat box and we'll, we'll address those at the end or, um, you know, we have, we're very fortunate in MA to have a, a community of uh, experts surrounding us. So uh, if you have an answer to a question, feel free to, to jump there in the chat as well. This is just kind of a, a fun thing that we'll all just kind of experience together. So a little overview of Holly Nature Sanctuary. Here we have a satellite view. Uh, the sanctuary is pretty much right there, smack dab in the middle. Um, and then we are in Mason County, Victory Township, and we're eight miles northeast of Ludington, which you can see right there on the, the shores of Lake Michigan, kind of in the, in the bottom part of the, the map there. And so if we zoom in a little bit, uh, we have our 80 acres of the sanctuary right here. It was donated to m a in late 2018, and the street address is 4834 West Dewey Road, Ludington. So we'll get into a little bit of the history. Um, when we're talking about um, you know, this, this land, we're talking about the land of the Anishinaabe. So the United States government, the Ottawa and Ojibwe tribes entered the Tree of Washington, DC in 1836. The tribes ceded about 13 million acres, making the largest amount of land ceded by the tribes. And that accounts for roughly 40% of the current land area of the state of Michigan. And so just like the other treaties, tribes had to leave the land given to the United States government. The tribes received money, services, and rights to hunt, fish, and harvest. And this treaty also created reservations. 
and you can see you can get a more good information at the website there that'll also be uh, at the end of the presentation i'll have a a little collection of links for you to dig into if you want some more info about any of the stuff we covered today um a, a bit more specifically we're in the uh the region of the little river band of ottawa indians um, these, this tribe descended from members of certain Grand River Ottawa bands who lived in villages located on the Manistee River, Paramarquette River, and at several villages on the Grand River system in Michigan. And as a result of historic circumstances, only that portion of the Grand River Ottawa people now known as the Little River Band of Ottawa had its status as a federally recognized Indian tribe reaffirmed and restored by the United States in 1994. And you can see our little pink star where our sanctuary is, is uh, pretty comfortably in that area covered by that Washington Treaty of 1836. Uh, jumping forward a little bit in time, um, 1856, Congress uh, gives a land grant to Michigan for railroad construction. So our understanding is that um, the railroads were to keep the land just the land that they needed for their own railroads and the rest of the land they would sell for money to fund these railroad projects. Um, in 1872, a Danish immigrant named Johnny Johnson Millwood, pictured here with his wife Bodil, purchased the parcel that would become the Holly Nature Sanctuary from the Flint and Paramarquette Railroad. Uh, John and Bodil lived on a 40 acre farm about 1.5 mi miles from where the sanctuary is. Um, and I should say, you know, another huge shout out to Frank uh, for sharing all these uh, historical photographs and, and documents. These have been, these really kind of enrich our understanding of, of the sanctuary. Uh, like so many other places in Michigan, uh, the sanctuary is clear cut in the late, late 1800s and it transitioned at that point to open pasture. It was used for grazing cattle by John and his son Henry uh, after him. Henry was an artist. Uh, you can see his self-portrait here. Um, and he had a great fondness for the sanctuary and its natural beauty. Uh, it functioned as pasture up until 1940. And at that point, uh, it was allowed to transition into forest. It just kind of that natural succession was allowed to take place. And finally, uh, Henry left the property to his daughter, Doris Holly, and her husband, Birdsell. They built a small house or cabin on the property. And then Doris and Birdsell passed the property on to their children, Frank and Brenda. And then finally in 2018, the parcel was donated to MA to be put into con conservation. Um, and as part of this, you know, very generous donation, there were many components. Um, there was a donor agreement, which was uh, a bit special for uh for MA. Uh, and we'll break that down. Uh, the donor agreement, the stewardship had two main components. The first was management, which um, M&A, you know, does a lot of uh, maintain and manage for the ecological structure and function of the existing natural communities and native species which occur on the sanctuary. And then this next component was the one that was a bit special uh, for the Holly Sanctuary in particular, outreach and education. So we wanted to have the sanctuary provide enhanced community outreach and environmental education opportunities. So just a little bit on the management side, um, some things that that entails are invasive species control. You can see here along Dewey Road on the southern border of the sanctuary, we had some Phragmites uh, growing. And so a priority for me uh, in 2019 was to treat that patch. We've monitored it uh, each year since and it hasn't returned. And so we'll check it out this year as well and, and into the future to make sure that that, that doesn't become a problem. We're also monitoring forest pests, um, in particular, uh, forest pests that's become a big concern for land managers in this, uh, in this area is the hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, which attacks hemlock trees. And so uh, we're doing monitoring for that. Uh, we also have a deer management program where we partner with, uh, or rather we have agreements with some local hunters to help uh, manage the deer herd on the property to keep some of that herbivore pressure down. Uh, so some of the, the flora can regenerate and flourish a bit better. And then we maintain access and trails. You can see here, one of our big projects last year was to install this parking loop to allow folks to safely come and go. 
and then you know maintaining the trail system and installing little bog bridges like this one to help people cross some of the wetter, muckier parts. And the other component of our stewardship is this outreach and education, um, community engagement. Um, we've been reaching out to schools, uh, nearby colleges. Um, we have the school to sanctuary program where we uh, connect with K through 12 schools to facilitate outdoor education or uh, place-based education opportunities and field trips. And then just working on uh, these partnerships. So uh, in the picture on the right here and, and also on the left, you see um, some of our uh, <laughs> community neighbors who have been uh, so enthusiastic in their support of what we're doing out here. These, uh, these, folks, these good folks here are uh, part of a local organization called A Few. That's A-F-F-E-W, A Few Friends for the Environment of the World. And they are just uh, excellent stewards and uh, they've been a great resource in helping us connect. And they provided this boot brush station at our trailhead. Uh, and so they've been great. And a fourth component uh, is hosting events like this one, a virtual nature hike through our sanctuary. And speaking of, let's uh, get into it. So this is our sanctuary. This will be our virtual hike. Uh, you can see the parking area down there, the white star, that's where we start. And we have a blue loop in the south. And then where the blue loop connects this yellow loop in the north, we have a little uh, creek crossing. And all told, um, it's about one and a quarter miles of uh, trails at, at the sanctuary. So really, really great for a walk. We'll take you on a little uh, whirlwind tour of a leg of the Blue Loop right now. Uh, this was just me walking on a, on a beautiful summer day. You can see some of the blue trail markers off to the side through this time lapse. And that gets us to our bog bridge. And then we'll check out a little section of the Yellow Loop as well. Uh, the trails are marked in both directions. so. No matter which way you decide to, to tackle the loop, um, you'll, be, uh, you'll be able to find your way around. So let's talk a little bit about some of the natural communities that we have at the sanctuary. A natural community is defined as an assemblage of interacting plants, animals, and other organisms that repeatedly occurs under similar environmental conditions across the landscape. So we'll start in this little area in the very southwest corner, outlined in orange there. This is right next to the parking area. You can see um, just full of ferns here, uh, moss. You can see cattails in the background and leather leaf. And this is a shot of it in the winter. And this is all very typical of a bog natural community. Next, we'll move into this area highlighted in orange that kind of slashes on a diagonal uh, in the, again, in the Southwest. And it is just this impenetrable wall of speckled alder and winterberry. Um, and then sort of at the ground level, you see ferns and sedges. And this is very typical of a Northern shrub thicket. And the rest of that southwest portion, uh, we have a lot of red oak, red pine, uh, white pine uh, forming the canopy. Below that, we have a nice layer of uh, witch hazel. And then at ground level, we have blueberry, um, a lot of bracken fern, uh, other wildflowers and uh, forbs and ferns and sedges. And this is all pretty typical of a dry mesic northern forest. And here you can see the maples are really uh, putting on a, their fall display. And once we get across the shrub thicket, uh, we get to the rest of the sanctuary. And this is pre uh, predominantly two uh, ecosystem or uh, natural community types. So it's all, it's all forested. Uh, but here we see a lot of maple, red pine, poplar, hemlock. Uh, at ground level, we have the forbs, grasses, sedges. And this is a mesic northern forest. 
And then the rest of it uh, in pockets, we have these red maples, birches, hemlocks again, uh, and these meat hummocks, which are these kind of moss covered lumps and, uh, and logs uh, as well, sedges, grasses, uh, and then these carpeted areas of sphagnum moss that you know, periodically flood and are wet, and sometimes they're dry and you can walk across them. But this is pretty typical of a hardwood conifer swamp. So that pretty much takes you through broadly uh, the natural communities that uh, you'll see at Holly. It's just uh, an amazing diversity within 80 acres of uh, habitat types. And now we're going to kind of zoom in and look at some of the particular uh, organisms that you can find out there. So this is the part of the hike that I like. Um, we'll just kind of go through picture by picture. I'll sit. I'll have a, a few things to say here and there, but um, I think one of the the best parts about being on a hike, virtual or not, is just being able to kind of take in some of the sights. Um, what's nice about this virtual hike is that we're not bound to any one season, so we can see this same area here in the winter as we move along. Here we have uh, the late uh, spring or early summer uh, kind of uh, poplar seed fluff everywhere, kind of created this very weird, like uh, <laughs> almost snow covered effect on the ground, which lasted for you know a couple of days. But um, the timing on that was really kind of cool. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, jump in the chat box, um, and you know we can address those questions at the end, or if um, you know, you happen to be a botanist or <laughs> uh, a naturalist uh, and you have an answer, uh, I welcome you to, to engage as well. Here's a cool, a cool plant. This is called ghost plant or Indian pipe. Uh, it lacks the chlorophyll of, you know, most other plants. Um, it gets its energy from uh, a relationship with, the, with trees that it grows near. And then on a lot of these pictures, you'll be able to see our trail markers as well. This was a new plant for me um, coming to the West Michigan region. Most of my experience was over in the Southeast Ann Arbor area. And this is um, rattlesnake plantain. And it just is the coolest little plant that, you know, you're likely to miss if you're, if you're not uh, taking time to, to pause and kind of root around in the leaf litter, but it has these basil leaves that just, are so gorgeous. It's like a variegated, almost looks like a variegated leaf on like a, a house plant you'd find. And then in the picture on the right, you can see it's sent up its uh, inflorescence, which even as you know tall as it's trying to be, it doesn't quite peak above the ferns. And of course, in the fall, we have some of our maples just putting on these dazzling displays. Here we have a zoomed out view of a little sedge meadow growing along the margins of the shrub thicket, and then a closer up view of one of our sedges. Here's some of our mosses. I spend so much time when I'm out there just crawling around, just being like, in awe of <laughs> all these beautiful forms and, and different types of, uh, of plants. Here is witch hazel, which is probably our latest bloomer. So this is, you know, a lot of the trees have already lost their leaves by the time this, uh, this shrub starts to bloom. And this is one of the coolest trees. This is right where the, the yellow loop branches off. So if you head out there and, uh, and walk the trail, you can't miss this one. It's a, it's a beauty. And 
and I love tree bark. It's just, there's just so much variety, so many cool forms. And that was plants. So now we'll kind of move on to animals and have a look at some of our, some of our other residents at the sanctuary. I believe this was a great spangled fritillary. This just goes to show you Holly Nature Sanctuary is not immune to the, the housing crisis. No, that's a, that's a slug that, that never has a shell. The snail, the snail has a shell. We have various caterpillars. And this is just so cool. Uh, redback salamanders, which I had never seen before. Uh, two years ago, were just under almost every log uh, you would uh, you would overturn, and um, uh, the eastern redback salamander, and they're just a really cool woodland salamander, and they were just everywhere. I did some googling to try to find out if this was a garter snake or a ribbon snake. I think it was a ribbon snake. Uh, the picture isn't isn't great for helping to determine if we have any herpetologists in the chat. Uh, let us know what you think. And then sometimes uh, you don't see the animal itself, but you see the signs that kind of give you clues as to who might be here. Uh, in the left, you see all these holes drilled by, uh, or rather pecked by a, a pileated woodpecker. And then on the right, this was kind of a mystery for me. Um, this was actually on the bog bridge uh, that we saw in the picture earlier. You know, it looked to me like something that resembles an owl pellet. Um, but if you look at the, the contents, there's like crayfish parts. So we know we have, you know, crayfish in the wetlands, presumably, but there's also branches. And so I was kind of at a loss. I thought maybe a raccoon or um, one of my other stewards who I often uh, pass my animal questions on to, he suggested that maybe a mink or something. Um, but yeah, that one, that one kind of stumped us. So if you have any ideas, uh, jump in the chat and let us know what you think. Uh, an antler shed and of course, droppings everywhere, <laughs> just from the residents coming and going. Um, we're pretty sure these were bobcat tracks. I set up the trail cams, but wasn't able to to catch any verification. Uh, but I believe this was, these are rabbit tracks in the snow as well. I did try crossing the shrub thicket once. I got soaked, uh, but I also got this picture of the frog, so, so probably worth it. Uh, monarch butterfly caterpillar, and then the adult stage on a, on a bee balm. And then we have a little video here of something that you'll see in the coming weeks. Hey everyone, Rob Johnston here with Michigan Nature Association. I'm out in Mason County today at our Franklin Tent and Brenda L. Holly Nature Sanctuary. And I just thought I'd highlight for you real quick one of the cool little features of the warming weather. So on warm winter days like this, in the snow, you can often see these little black specks uh, maybe you can see them here filling the boot print that I left when I walked in about an hour ago, and it's filled with these little jumping black dots. So these are called springtails, also commonly called snow fleas, even though they are not actually fleas, and they're not even um, insects, although they are six-legged arthropods. These little guys live under the snow all winter, um, eating dead leaves. They're not harmful to humans, pets, or plants, or anybody. They're just doing their own thing, um, eating dead leaves. And on days like this, where it's still snowy, but you know it's pushing 40 degrees out here, it's a really nice day, you'll start seeing them popping up uh, kind of all over the place. So just another cool little feature of the, the, warming, the warming weather as we move from winter and transition into spring. So keep an eye out for them. And, if you're in the neighborhood, stop by the Franklin Net and Brenda L. Holly Nature Sanctuary. Bye. All right, and then here are some uh, some zoomed in photos that I was able to get of the of the springtails. 
Uh, another part of the generous donation, um, Frank provided us with some trail cams to try and catch some of the wildlife coming and going. Um, this was a, uh, a white cedar that had uh, blown over. And so I figured the deer would have been very interested in browsing off some of the newly accessible uh, branches. So I set up the trail cam and caught these, uh, these visitors. And then we'll do another one. check on the trail cam I put up the other day, and lo and behold, look who I found. So that's our North American porcupine. That was our porcupine. <laughs> the video is a bit longer. It's on our, uh, I believe, our Instagram and our and our Facebook and YouTube. So you can check out the full video. It's just like two minutes, but uh, but we'll keep going. This is some of the other images I caught on that trail cam when I checked it. We uh, we definitely saw the porcupine. We also saw a possum and a raccoon. I did this little goofy composite of all three hanging out, um, which they definitely did not do at the same time. Uh, then we caught our porcupine in action. Look at it go. And so that's, uh, those are the animals that we've seen so far. Now we'll get into the protists. Um, this is uh, just a fascinating, mysterious uh, kingdom to me that I don't have a ton of experience with. These are the slime molds. Um, I mistook a lot of these for fungi the first time I saw them. Uh, had to do a little uh, digging around to actually find out what some of these things were. This one in particular is called wolf's milk. And this one has the charming name of uh, dog vomit slime mold. And it's just a really cool, <laughs> cool, um, cool kingdom of organisms. And now fungi. So this is probably my one of my favorite features of the, of the sanctuary is just the diversity of forms and colors of fungi. I, I just can't get enough of it. I'm, I'm so excited for, for this summer or spring, summer and fall, just to see what pops up. Cause it seems like every time you go out, there's something new and weird and wonderful to see. And so my phone is just a, a disaster of mushroom pictures from, from this sanctuary. Um, and I'll, I'll try and go through these fast because I took a lot of pictures of mushrooms. Um, and I guess the nice thing about this is, you know, you don't have to go crawling around on your hands and knees like a, like a crazy person. You can just sit in the comfort of your, your chair and look at these, these beautiful fungi. So we're gonna let, you, let you keep going through the pictures, but let's um, talk about some of the questions that have come in so far while you go through all these pictures. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, an opinion question of when is the best time of year for you to get out and walk through the sanctuary? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say, I think late summer has been my favorite, um, you know, Early summer, mosquitoes can be uh, an issue, uh, but I, I found that like later in the summer, you know, with the heat and stuff like that, um, you know, the sanctuary is very comfortable for a walk and you see a lot of really cool stuff. Um, but really it, it's great anytime. I, I've been, you know, out there in the winter with the, the snowshoes, it's great to walk around, but I feel like you definitely get more bang for your buck. Uh, getting into the, the summer. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like there's still snow on the ground up there. Uh, yeah, yep, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, especially in the, 
yeah, being in the woods, um, quite a bit of quite a bit of snow still, less and less. And I will say, or I should mention, you know, going through all these these pictures of the plants and the fungi and things like that. Um, just remember, uh, pictures are the best way to remember your trip out there. We don't uh, we don't allow any foraging or collecting um, at our sanctuaries. So um, take all the pictures you can. Uh, tag us if you post them. <laughs> we love to see what you what you find out there. Yeah, thank you for that great reminder, Rob. Um, and then we had a question about the uh, the plants in the sanctuary. Has there been any native plant restoration activity, or have those all been uh, grown naturally? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, those are all plants that have just been occurring naturally. Um, we haven't done any uh, native plant. Uh, I don't know what you'd call it, maybe landscaping, or we haven't introduced any uh, any plants yet. Uh, you know, but definitely it's something to think about. You know, there's definitely something to be said for increasing, you know, various types of diversity depending on your, your management goals. Okay, good information. Great to hear that things are occurring naturally in our sanctuaries. Yeah. Um, maybe we can talk about, um, there's a question about bringing back tours that m &A did a few years ago, and I can say I know that we're not doing any in-person events right now, um, which is why we're able to uh, uh, bring these virtual tours to people, but um, did you want to speak to that at all, Rob? Uh, I think... Uh, we might be moving towards possibly, you know, offering those tours again. Um, I would say just keep an eye on the website. Um, and then, you know, if you are in the area or, um, you know, if you're interested, um, smaller, I guess, maybe private engagements, you know, could be arranged, you know, to, to go on a guided hike or something like that. I think the thing that we're hesitant to do is to open up some of these large scale public events. So, you know, as, as much as we can like safely have these, you know, smaller gatherings outside, I think that's, that's something we're moving towards. So definitely be in touch. Um, we're always happy to at least have the conversation and, and try to work something out if we can. Cool. And, and how I, would people get a hold of you to arrange that? Yeah, uh, I'll have my uh, email address at the end. Uh, and also, you know, the website has everybody's contact info. Uh, but I think this is my last mushroom slide, <laughs> my last fungi. Uh, and yeah, this is the last image I wanted to leave you with uh, from our hike. We've, we've done all 1.25 miles um, crawling around through the sanctuary. And so we made it back to the, the trailhead, the parking lot, and this is Dewey Road heading east. And so for me, this last slide just really conjures um, memories of that uh, like heady aroma of sun warmed white pine on a hot summer day. And that's just, uh, that's the, the sensory uh, <laughs> image I would like to leave you all with. And uh, yeah, that's the end. Thank you so much for sticking with me through all of that and the million mushroom pictures. If you want more info, these are the links. Um, no need to write these down because um, these will be, you know, in the recording. So you'll have access to all these. It's just Michigan Nature Association. If you're interested in more info on the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, um, you can learn about their governmental stuff, but also some good language and cultural resources at the, at the second website there. Uh, a few, their website, they have a lot of events in and around the Ludington area. They're great to stay connected to. Um, I... And these last two are resources that I make almost daily use of uh, MNFI, uh, Michigan Natural Features Inventory, and the University of Michigan Herbarium for identification of pretty much everything you just saw. <laughs> uh, yeah, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you had a good time at this one, definitely stop by on March 24th 
Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, my counterpart in the on the east side of the state, Zach, will be taking you to Donner Martin Nature Sanctuary. Uh, very excited for that one. Um, so definitely register and we hope to see you there. And as always, the website, uh, you can go there anytime and find a sanctuary near you. And yeah, if there were any other questions um, that folks had, I'd love to take a crack at it or <laughs> anybody else. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, Rob. That was a great presentation. We have so many comments about your beautiful photos. So get ready for questions about those. But we are um, getting a whole lot of questions in the Q&A. So um, for those of you who do want to stick around um, for the Q&A, please feel free to enter your questions in that Q&A feature and we will um, go through them as they come in. Uh, we will probably only be able to answer, um, I, I've already seen a few duplicate questions, so we'll just answer those one time. <laughs> um, okay. Some folks are hopping off, so just that's my email address and miigwech, thank you all for attending. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And we'll be sure to put that in a follow-up email for people. Um, who maybe uh, missed that. I saw a few people left before you called that up. So um, first question is, do you use an app to map your nature sanctuaries and does it let you show where the plants are located? Ooh, um, I do not personally, I don't think MNA has generally in the past. Um, uh, an app that I've been using quite a bit to just, uh, identify and uh, I guess attribute uh, pictures and, and things I've seen to the sanctuary is iNaturalist. That is a, a wonderful app that uh, I can't recommend strongly enough um, for somebody who is, I definitely consider myself a very enthusiastic amateur in mycology and botany and, and all these other, and herpetology and all these other disciplines. Um, and so having a kind of a pocket field guide that sort of covers all these bases has been awesome. Um, but as far as specific locations of different species or organisms, um, I don't think we generally tend to track that, but that's a very good question. Yes, we do have, like you said, the, the iNaturalist um, uh, project for Holly Nature Sanctuary. Um, and I believe iNaturalist already filters out the rare species. Um, and I should say, uh, in the month of April, um, the Holly Nature Sanctuary will be part of the MSU Science Festival's BioBlitz. So um, we will be sharing information about that on our social media and our emails as well. Um, more details, obviously, to be worked out. Um, similarly, as I scrolled down to check on more questions, I saw a question about whether or not the sanctuary is on eBird. Do you know about that, Rob? Ooh, a bird. <laughs> Birding is um, something that's also like high on my list of something to get into. Um, I, I do not know if it specifically has an eBird, um, if it's an eBird site or location, but um, yeah, definitely a lot of birds out there. <laughs> All right, good to know. We'll have to investigate. Um, did you say, uh, did you catch the bobcat on the trail camera? No, no. I actually was out at the sanctuary today and set the trail cams up. And I saw some fresh tracks that I assume must be the bobcat. Um, and so, yeah, fingers crossed. It's a, it's a tricky one. They're also nocturnal. So um, you got to make sure you have enough battery in your trail cam for uh, <laughs> the nighttime uh, footage and photos. But um, yeah, definitely keep an eye on our Instagram and uh, different social media uh, because any videos or updates will definitely make their way over there. Awesome, yes, thank you. Please share those. I know people are anxious to see the bobcat. Do not pet the bobcat. Right. <laughs> um, uh, I know you said you're not into birding a whole lot, but do you have any bird species that you have seen or that you know have been seen at the sanctuary? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, our sanctuary steward actually is a awesome naturalist. He was in uh, one of the earlier pictures talking about community engagement. Uh, Dave Dister, 
he is an avid birder and he has just this exhaustive list of all these birds that I could never <laughs> recognize for the life of me at this point. But um, yeah, a, a great, a great variety. Um, at least, you know, personally I've seen um, in one of the wetlands, uh, a heron of some sort. I think it might've been the, like a, a green or something. Uh, I've seen the pileated woodpecker. Um, I saw an owl of some sort flying through the hemlocks, which was amazing. Um, yeah, the, the birding is a very uh, actually frustrating thing for me because I just see and hear birds everywhere and I have no idea what's happening around me. So um, I guess uh, goals for 2022 is to get, to get better at birds. But um, if you're a birder, I would highly recommend checking the sanctuary out. You will, um, you'll not be disappointed. Okay, yeah, and we'll see if we can dig up some uh, some species notes that might be on our servers somewhere and maybe be able to share those with people too. Yes. Um, maybe that can be our next uh, virtual sanctuary tour. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a question about what phone you are using for your, all your photos. Oh, uh, I don't know. What, what, what is our phone? It's the... <laughs> <laughs> It's the MA. Um, no, the MA standard issue is a, a Samsung. Um, uh, unfortunately, they don't put the name of the phone on the back of the phone, and I'm not going to dig through the options on it. But yes, it, it, Rob is just using his cell phone. Um, so, a good, a good point about the amazing photos that you can get with just a cell phone. So, or a smartphone, I guess they are now. Yeah, how to find out what model this is. I think it's a Samsung Galaxy something. That's sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, a, a request for a uh, another um, presentation dedicated to all your uh, fungi um, species with identifications. So I would love that. Yeah, less of a question and more of a directive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm so into it. Yeah. Oh, I know Rob would love that. Um, okay, if you see what you think might be an invasive species. Who should it be reported to? Uh, yeah, uh, give me a heads up. Shoot me an email or um, I, I think my phone number also might be on the uh, on the website. Um, but yeah, um, any, any updates like that, definitely reach out. Um, I'd love to know. And then just if you can give me like an approximate location or, or identification. If you've identified it as an invasive species, you, we've, we've covered that. Um, but yeah, if you can kind of let me know where it is, uh, that would be a huge help. Um, and then we can, as much as possible, jump on control. Uh, that said, um, it, the sanctuary is like amazingly uh, free of most invasive species. Um, a little bit of, like you saw, Phragmites and the odd, you know, autumn olive along the the road edge, but for the most part, the interior is just amazing. So, um, but yeah, if you see a garlic mustard or something, uh, <laughs> definitely let me know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and the next question, similarly, I think you pretty much answered it um, of have we been monitoring for invasive species, of course, but. Yeah, that's a big part of, you know, uh, my visits out there and also um, looking to, you know, connect with schools through our school to sanctuary program uh, because invasive species, you know, education and monitoring is a great activity for uh, <laughs> students. Um, and so if there are any teachers joining us and you're interested in, in connecting, you know, whether it be the Holly Nature Sanctuary or a uh, MA Sanctuary closer to you, if you're joining from, you know, some other, you know, locality, um, definitely reach out because we are always, always looking for those opportunities to engage. Uh, primary stewardship activities. Um, I should actually word that as a question. That would be helpful. What are the primary stewardship activities? And second part to the question, what impact does Lake Michigan play on the sanctuary in terms of precipitation winds, if any? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so uh, for the most part, uh, stewardship activities, was that the first... Uh, yeah. What are the stewardship activities? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, for the most part, it's trail maintenance. Um, 
right now. Um, there aren't, you know, as I said, too terribly many uh, invasive species concerns. So it's mostly making sure the trail remains safe and accessible for folks to, to walk on and the markings are all in order. Um, also, um, yeah, the trail and there was another thing. Uh, I'll go, to, I'll move on to the weather, um, which I'm not sure uh, how much Lake Michigan necessarily affects it beyond just like, you know, being in a county that is on the lake shore. Um, uh, I would, if I'm remembering correctly, Hamlin Lake, I think lies between the sanctuary and Lake Michigan. So, you know, there are a lot of different factors. Um, the sanctuary definitely, um, you know, for whatever, uh, for whatever reason gets a lot of uh, wind throw. And so after major like storms or wind events that come through, you know, we'll see a lot of downed treetops and tip ups throughout the sanctuary, which just kind of introduce a whole new uh, set of resources. And, uh, you know, when you have a tree that falls over in a wind event, you know, you all of a sudden have a lot of more light coming down to the forest floor. And so there's this mad dash of, uh, you know, a profusion of saplings and, and seedlings that that germinate and, and race for the sky. So um, whether or not that has a, anything to do with the lake, I couldn't say. Um, yeah, the, the weather and the, the meteorological uh, component isn't something I'm, I'm too well versed in, but it's a, yeah, de definitely a great question. It's got to have an effect, I would think. I just don't know the specifics. Well, it certainly took down that cedar tree, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, are there currently any uh, studies or research underway at Holly? Um, no current research projects. Um, we did partner up with um, Paul Blinsky. He's a biology teacher at West Shore Community College, uh, just down the road. And he, uh, the sanctuary hosts his summer flora class. And so he does uh, plant identification uh, for his students out of the site. He has set up a couple quad rats, um, just a couple um, like one meter square plots where he has his students um, work on some plant identification and, and things like that. Um, but in terms of like hard scientific research, we don't currently have anything. We have a lot of opportunities. Um, I would love to do things like water quality or, you know, forest health or, um, you know, forest composition, soil, just there, just, you know, we're, we're open to, to anything and everything out there. Um, so if you have a question that you're looking to dig into or some research uh, project that uh, you'd like to, to explore, definitely get in touch. We'd love to, love to talk about that uh, because that's, you know, obviously it's, you know, an academic pursuit, uh, which has its benefits for you, but um, any, uh, research or findings you have are, are a great benefit to m a as well so yeah that's a great point we do we do have a lot of um a lot of research projects underway at other nature sanctuaries um we're, we're very fortunate to have a lot of um partners in the university um spectrum all over the state so um and all of that research helps us uh learn more about you know the various aspects of the, the sanctuaries we manage and also about our management activities. So um, yeah, like Rob said, if you if you have a research project you'd like to do at Holly, we're we're open to uh, talking about it. So. My ecologists go to the top of the pile in, <laughs> in my review. So if you have a any anything fungi related, uh, definitely get in touch. Or meteorologically. So we can <laughs> all right. We've got just a few more questions here. Um, it is getting close to the hour. So we'll be wrapping this up here. Um, if people do need to leave, we just, I want to say thank you again for joining us. Um, and, and hopefully you can uh, join us at our next presentation on March 24th uh, for Donner Martin. Uh, more information on that is at michigannature.org. Uh, all right, last few questions. Uh, nearby sanctuary, um, Emily sees a red dot in Southern Lake County. Uh, what is this sanctuary called? 
and is it open to the public? Yeah, so in Southern Lake County, uh, I believe that's our Pear Marquette Plant Preserve. It's a, it's a tiny, oh gosh, I think it's, I don't think it's even an acre. <laughs> but it's this uh, tiny little um, spot on the, on the Pear Marquette. Um, and it's not open to the public um, just because we don't have any access. We're, we're kind of hemmed in on all sides. Um, so there's no road access. We get special permission to access it to do our monitoring and, and any, you know, whenever we need to get out there, we reach out to a landowner uh, adjacent and he lets us access. Um, if you find yourself on the Pear Marquette, either, you know, canoeing or kayaking, um, and you, <laughs> and you're, uh, and you're diligently watching the shoreline, you may see our sanctuary boundary signs. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a very tiny little, little spot. So uh, difficult, difficult to visit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are more accessible ones uh, that I would recommend. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> A very good question. Um, speaking of access and uh, boundaries to sanctuaries, that leads us to our next question uh, about who owns the land adjacent to Holly Nature Sanctuary and what are the expansion uh, potentials for the sanctuary? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, our neighbors, uh, we've met our neighbors at least to the, to the east and west. Um, the most of the the properties surrounding us, um, you know, there's the the occasional house, um, but for the most part, these are uh, mostly areas that folks use for hunting. Um, and so, yeah, we are we're always uh, looking for those opportunities to expand, you know, sanctuaries, you know as you kind of increase the scale and, and sort of get on this sort of landscape sort of scale, you know, you, uh, there are just so many more benefits to, to increasing the, the acreage in, in conservation in terms of the species that you can support and the different types of habitats and natural communities. So, um, you know, as the opportunities present themselves, we're always, uh, always willing to take a look. Um, but so far, uh, I don't think anything has, has popped up uh, adjacent. But that's a that's a very good question. Thank you. Hopefully, we always keep our fingers crossed for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, what uh, I know the answer to these, of course, but Rob, can you inform us all on uh, what it costs to visit the sanctuary and what hours is it open? None money. It's free. Free to visit. Um, I think uh, daylight hours is a is a good rule of thumb. Uh, for visiting, uh, just to to make sure you're safe out there. Um, yeah, uh, any sanctuary uh, that you can get to um, is is free to visit. I would love to do like a, a nighttime, like you know, I know some places do like owl, you know, hikes or like nocturnal sorts of things. So you know, there's definitely potential for some of these one-off sort of things. But yeah, if you stick to daylight hours find a sanctuary, um, yeah, it's, uh, you're good to go. And we have more uh, sanctuary visitation um, suggestions and, and guidelines on our website. So um, go ahead and check that out before you go out just to get all the information that you need. Um, click on whatever sanctuary you, uh, on the sanctuary map you think that uh, you wanna go to and uh, that'll give you some, some helpful planning tips too, so. Um, that's our last question. We do have one final comment that is a great point and I wanna make sure to bring it up um, along the lines of take only pictures and leave only footprints. Sarah uh, suggests to help uh, prevent the spread of invasive species to use the boot scraper uh, that is at the trailhead before, you, before and after using the trail system. So um, yes, and that was a great donation to us as well. So thank you, Sarah, for bringing that up. Um, and thank you, Rob, for this presentation. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you all at the next uh, presentation.